Hello, I'm Greg Solomon. Folks, before I get to the context of this video, I just want to answer some comments and some uh, personal messages that I got inquiring about a perceived weight loss. People ask me if I had lost some weight. Uh, for a number of years, I have eaten a very low-fat, healthy diet. And several months ago, I began reading some very bad, negative things about hydrogenated oil and partially hydrogenated oil. And I decided to eliminate that from my diet. I just eliminated all anything. I look in the label if it says hydrogenated oil or partially hydrogenated oil, I don't touch it. And um, just as a natural consequence of that, I lost a few pounds. Not a lot, but a, a few pounds. I don't have a very large frame, so just a few pounds might show up on me. However, according to those height and weight charts, you know, that you you can find them out on the internet or wherever. Um, I am the perfect weight for my height. Perfect, right in the middle of the scale. And I feel in excellent health. I would advise everyone out there to eliminate hydrogenated oil uh, from your diet. It's a real nasty thing if you read about it. Now, let me get to the context of, uh, of this video. I, I want you folks to know that I read the comments under my videos even if I don't always reply individually to each one, I'll, I'll, I'll read your comments. And I read several comments under my last video, the one I have titled uh, Atheism, Religion, and God. And there were a few comments. First, I was just going to answer them. I, I saw one or two, and then I saw a few more. So I thought, you know, I might as well just make a video. I can just answer, answer them quicker in, in a video instead of typing out individual answers. So I just wrote a few things down, um, a few comments and questions, and I'll just go through these and, uh, and give an answer to them. Uh, first of all, somebody, somebody asked me, they said, Greg, you said in your video, uh, when, a, when you were asking a preacher to explain why he believed in the Bible, what evidence he had, uh, he just finally said, well, I know that I know that I know. And this fellow said I, I was critical in, uh, in describing that and kind of criticized the preacher for that. And that a few minutes later I went on to say that everybody just knows what constitutes ethical behavior. And uh, this fellow wanted to know how I, uh, how I can reconcile this uh, contradiction or actually a perceived contradiction because actually there, there is no contradiction here. Um, let me explain this to you. Man is a social animal, okay? Man lives in groups and societies. Men tend to you know, live together in groups. Um, years and years of natural selection has hardwired into man a sort of um, moral grammar, if you will. And this moral grammar mandate certain behavior, certain things that you do to other men and other women, and certain things that you don't do, certain behaviors. And these behaviors guarantee that the group will prosper and flourish. That's all that is. That's uh, science, basically, what I'm talking about. This You can look it up. There's an, an innate... Um, universal moral grammar that's just high, hardwired into it's it's evolution some of you don't believe in evolution then you'll you'll have a problem with that but nonetheless it, it is uh, it is science and it, it's based in science as opposed to the preacher or anyone else who says the reason they believe in the Bible and there's some very incredulous stories in there because they know that they know that they know. Uh, stories such as a, uh, a snake uh, talking from a tree to a woman, um, a big fish swallowing a man up and then spitting him out. Um, another story, uh, imagine this fellow, he's just he's walking, mind his own business, and all of a sudden God calls down to him, Noah. The guy goes like this, and, Noah. Yes, God. And then God says, I want you to build 
a big boat. And I want you to take a male and a female animal of all the animals and put them on this boat once you've built it. And then you get on the boat with your wife and your sons. Get on this boat and seal it up. And I'm going to cause it to rain and flood the entire earth and kill everybody and all the other creatures on earth because they've all made me mad. I'm irritated with them. However, Noah, I'm not irritated with you. And then you ask someone how they know these stories are true. Well, what evidence do you have that these stories are true? To which they respond, well, I just know that I know that I know. Well, see, there's a big difference between that and that hardwired moral grammar that I was speaking of. Big difference. No contradiction to reconcile whatsoever. Um, somebody else wrote, um, said, Greg, we originally got our ethical standards from the Ten Commandments, so give religion some credit. Well, this individual is completely wrong in his premise, saying we originally got our ethical standards from the Ten Commandments. So you're telling me that before the Ten Commandments, nobody knew that it was wrong to murder. Nobody knew that it was wrong to, uh, to steal. Now, in other words, the, the, the Hebrews had to wander with Moses until they got to Mount Sinai. Not, not knowing right from wrong, not knowing it was wrong to kill, not knowing it was wrong to steal. They had to wait for 40 days while Moses climbed up on Mount Sinai and the Lord chiseled out these Ten Commandments and then Moses brought them down and told them what was right and wrong. I mean, do you really believe that? That people had uh, no ethical standards until Moses brought those down and told told those people. If those people didn't know that it was wrong to kill and wrong to steal and wrong to do a lot of other things, I posit to you that they wouldn't have even made it to Mount Sinai because they would have been killing each other and stealing from each other, etc., yeah, etc. Et so no, your, your premise is wrong and you're mistaken. Well, let's see what else we have here. Um, oh, somebody asked me, what about people who convert to religion as adults? Because I was equating um, religion being indoctrinated into kids the way fillings are put into a kid's teeth. So what about people who convert to religion as adults? Well, there's several explanations for that. Some of it is just the fear of hellfire. Um, they, they still have those memories in their head from when they were a kid of hellfire. If you don't do what this book says, and I have the book right here, you know, I got it here in case I need to refer to it for anything. If you don't do what this book says, if you don't believe in this book, you're going to go to a place that is burning. Okay? And there's this, there's this creature called the devil. And he has a pitchfork, and he will stab you with this pitchfork while you're burning. I, I don't know where he gets the pitchfork from. If it's bought from um, Ace Hardware or Lowe's or Home Depot, I don't know. But anyways. Um, they, this, the adult, even if they have not followed religion or been religious uh, all their lives, they still have those memories of that in there. So, so some of them will convert because of that. They're, they're starting to get older and they're starting to think, well, may, maybe that is true. May, maybe there is a place called hell, you know. So, you know, maybe I should get a little insurance here, you know. And s smart money just to go ahead and... Uh, and, and, and just just throw in everything with this with this book and and just uh, b believe this and you know, have a little insurance. Um, other people are um, other people are a product of broken lives essentially. Um, broken lives, um, no purpose, depressed. Uh, as far as purpose goes. I mean, look, look at that book that was written a few few years ago called The Purpose Driven Life. Um, 
it was a it was a bestseller. I, I think millions of copies of it were sold. And that, that's very telling in itself. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who need to read a book by a man to tell them how to have purpose in their lives. Well, this is the kind of people that usually will end up in, in a church. Or as I said, people who some people are just emotionally weak. Some people need to be led. Um, as I said, the depression. A lot of people are depressed. Um, no purpose in their life. They will go to church and they find a group support structure in church and, and a lot of things that help buoy them up. Um, you know, speaking of, of uh, depression in church, I, I will tell you a, a story and this is a, this is a true story. Um, a few years ago a lady prevailed upon me to come to her church to listen to a preacher. The church was a, a Wesleyan church, a Wesleyan church. Uh, she wanted me to come to this church and, and listen to this preacher, her preacher. She said, you, you'd, really, you'd really like this guy. I, mean, I said, well, I, I don't really care about listening to that. I'm not, I'm not really uh, interested in it. Um, you know, I've, I've read for myself um, the, the, the Bible, and I, I don't really care to hear his opinion of. She's, no, this, this guy really, uh, or he's a very good orator and uh, articulates himself very well and tells um, just, just good stories with moral precepts. She just, just please, just come and, and listen to him. So uh, she prevailed upon me and I did, out of courtesy. Went in there and sat and listened to the guy. And uh, when the church service was, was over, you know how a preacher will stand at the door and shake people's hand as they're going out. And uh, I get vibes sometimes from people. I, I can't explain it. I've, I've had it since I was as was a kid. And a lot of times, you know, as a matter of fact, most times are very accurate. I don't get vibes all the time, but I do sometimes. And when I do, they're very accurate. Um, I've actually tried to look for a logical explanation for it, and um, it might have something to do with uh, the collective unconscious of Carl Jung. He he writes. Um, well, you'd have to look that. I'm not going to go into that. Would be um, that would be something a subject for in a whole nother video. But anyways, be that as it may, when it came my turn to shake the preacher's hand as I was as leaving the door, I just I got a vibe from him. I just I I picked something up from him. So when we left the service, this lady asked me. She says, "Well, what what did you think of him?" And I said, "Well, to be honest with you." I felt he was depressed. I, I think he's a depressed man. And she says, Dep I mean, she looked at me like a dog at a new dish. Depressed? I said, yeah. Well, she says, what do you mean depressed? He's, he's a pastor. He pastors the church. He, he counsels people who are depressed. I said, well, I'm, I'm just telling you, you asked me my opinion, and that's what I think. I, I just felt that, feel that he's depressed. And she said, well, in, in what way? How can... I said, I don't know, I, I, in the exact words I, I used, I, I said, I, I just feel that he has, um, well, a storm going on in his life. Well, she thought that was, that was ridiculous. She, she had no idea why I would think such a thing. Uh, you're just being, you're just anti-religious or anti-pastors. I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's just the vibe I picked up from him. Well, a few weeks went by, maybe a month and a half, six weeks went by, the same lady prevailed upon me to come into this church again with her and, and listen to a message that this preacher was going to preach. I, I forget the, the subject of the message, but she said, oh, this is going to be a really good message. You just got to hear it, and it's very relevant to today. And, just... and I said, look, I'll go one more time, one more time with you, okay? And just to be nice, be courteous. So I went to this church. Now, you know, if you've ever been in uh, churches, they, they pretty much all have the same uh, context. They'll you know, start out with some announcements, and uh, they might sing a couple of, of hymns, um, and then they will uh, go around with a collection plate. Well, once that was all done, the preacher got up to the, the podium, but instead of preaching his message, he said, before I preach this message, he said, I have an announcement to make to the church. Now this is a true story. In fact, I would like to sometime get this lady on video to verify this. True story. He said, I, I, I need to make an announcement to the church. He said, this past um, 
Wednesday night, there was a church board meeting. And he said, folks, for the past several months, he said, I just felt as if I've had, and he acted like he was searching for words, and then he just said, well, I felt like I've had a storm going on in my life. Now I could see her face turn towards me like that, out of the corner of my eye, because those are the exact words that I had said to her six weeks previous concerning this guy. And he said, after the church board meeting on Wednesday night, and I nudged her like this with my elbow, and I said, he's going to resign. And she said, shh, don't say. After, uh, and it was this guy said, after the church board meeting Wednesday night, he said, I went home, and I sat down at my desk, and I wrote out this, and he pulled a paper out of his pocket. He said, it's my letter of resignation, and I'd like to read it to you. And he opened it up. Well, this lady's jaw dropped. As we're riding home, she, she, she says, I, I, don't, I, I don't understand. How, how could you possibly know? She said, that's the exact words he said. I said, I, I have no idea. I don't know. I, I pick up vibes from people. I, I, don't th I, I don't want to sound like it's anything mysterious or eerie. As I said, I've looked for a logical reason for it. And a, a lot of logic can be found in the concept of the collective unconscious, as I said, that Carl Jung has written about. But anyways, I told her, I said, I don't know, but that's what I felt about this guy. I said, that's why I don't go to churches and sit down and listen to these guys and let these guys lead me around. I let these guys tell me which direction I'm supposed to go in, because this poor fellow didn't even know what direction he's going in. He was depressed and felt like a storm was going on in his life. And there's people coming there twice on Sunday and Wednesday evenings, listening, listening to them, getting supposed guidance for their lives. And he's counseling people. He's got a storm going on in his life and depressed and counseling other people. That, that's one reason why I don't go um, and, and listen to these guys or visit these sanctuaries. I'm not interested in it. I have no need for it. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? Oh. There's just one more here. It's, it's one guy. He has written, I don't know, like five or six uh, different comments. He, he identifies himself as a Christian, but he seems to me to be probably the, the least Christian of, of anyone who has identified themselves as a Christian and has commented under my video. Um, one of his comments, he inquired whether I was searching or made the statement that oh, I think Greg is searching. Well, no, Greg isn't searching. Greg is acquiring knowledge, which is what I told you about in my other video, such as the, the Book of Mormon. I'm not searching for any answers in the Book of Mormon. I want to read it so I can understand what's going on with it. If I'm going to debate a subject with someone, if, if I'm going to debate, for instance, this book, this is the, the, uh, the Christian Bible. If I'm going to debate somebody concerning this book, I, I need to know what's in the book. See? I, I need to keep my powder dry. Or else I, I, I will uh, offer up a very poor and shallow debate. But because I know what's in it, I can debate it quite well. Same with the Book of Mormon, same with these other books. There's no search involved, actually. Uh, you know, and some people, some Christians, would like to think that, that somebody's, somebody's searching, somebody's, you know, that they're looking for answers because they can't, they just can't fathom that somebody is actually content with their lives without this stuff, without going to church. Somebody is, is content and uh, emotionally well-balanced and has actually achieved a state of self-actualization and is content and comfortable in their own skin and is able to think for themselves. You know, their mind just goes tilt when they think about that because they can't do it. They need to go and listen to that preacher. Maybe they're listening to a depressed preacher with a storm going on in his life. Uh, one of the other statements this fellow made here uh, concerning Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is uh, an, an atheist, well-known atheist. He wrote a book called The God Delusion. You might have heard of that book. You might know Richard Dawkins now that I've mentioned that book. Anyways, he said, 
quite excitedly. He said, Richard Dawkins stated a few weeks ago that a case could be made for God's existence. In other words, he's implying that, that Richard, Dawkins, Richard uh, Dawkins' um uh, belief in atheism is starting to crumble. He's, he's actually admitted that a case could be made for God's existence. Well, see, that's what some Christians do. They will, or a lot of religious people, they will make a statement as dogmatic fact and then just continue on, whereas the statement is actually incorrect. Again, incorrect in its premise. First of all, Richard Dawkins didn't just make this statement, this statement a few weeks ago. I mean, he said this years ago. You can look this up in, on uh, YouTube if you want. There's videos of Richard Dawkins making the statement. Um, but the thing is, Richard Dawkins isn't talking about a theistic God. Richard Dawkins is talking about a deistic God. And what he's saying is there is a case, uh, a case can be made for a deistic God. The implication being, see, he's, he's debating with someone. He's saying, okay, a case can be made for a deistic God. The implication being, a case cannot be made for a theistic God. The difference being, a deistic God would be um, a, a, a God who just um, started the universe up. For instance, maybe with the Big Bang. Someone could, could make a case for that and say, okay, there was a God and he started the universe up with a Big Bang. The Big Bang didn't just happen by itself. He started this God, started it up, and, um, and then set these laws in motion, the you know, law of thermodynamics, the law of gravity, the law of this. All the laws were set in motion with the creation of the universe, and there's an implied order in the universe. And there, there's a lot of theories that have to do with a deistic God, uh, clockwork, Universe theory is one of them, like uh, God created the universe with a big bang, kind of wound, wound it up, and it's winding down, etc., uh, etc. Et but he's not, that God is not a personal God. Now, Richard Dawkins isn't saying that he believes in a deistic God, not at all. He's just saying, okay, a case can be made for that God. A person can't say one way or another whether a God started or you know, caused the big bang or didn't. What Richard Dawkins is saying by saying a case could be made for a deistic God, as I said, he's saying by implication, when he's debating, he's saying the case can't be made for a theistic God, which is a personal God. That God who yelled down and said, Noah, Noah, you need to build a boat. See, you, you can't make a case for that God. There's no scientific evidence for that God. That has to be accepted on total blind faith. That's all Richard Dawkins is saying. Uh, this fellow and a lot of others like him have found the statement of Richard Dawkins. Uh, heck, even Chris, Christopher Hitchens has said such a thing. They're not saying they believe in a deistic God. They're just simply saying, hey, okay, a case can be made for that. But a theistic God is a far, far cry from a deistic God. And you can look that up on the, uh, on the internet if you want to research it more, read about the difference between deism and theism. Um, now, oh, one more thing, too. Uh, another fellow, there is one other comment. He said, uh, I, I talked about proselytizing in my other video, and he said, well, the reason we proselytize is because God has commanded us to. Well, no, no. That's what you believe. You believe God has commanded you to because it's written in this book and you have decided to use blind faith and believe what's written in this book. Say, I mean, fellow in states that as, it's, as if it's an empirical fact. God has commanded us to... No, no. That's just what you believe. Now, let me say something to you Christians out there, I'm just going to speak to you, you Christians and you, you other uh, fellows and, and ladies out there who aren't Christians, you can sit back with your favorite beverage and just listen to me talk to the Christians here. This is between me and the, and the Christians and the audience, Christians who have made some comments under my video, um, talking about, well, and Greg this and Christianity that. And, you know, I would tell you that 
you folks, you, you Christians out there who are so quick to point your finger at people who possibly do not believe in your book or do not believe in the stories in your book or do not take your book literally and you point your finger at these people and say you're in big trouble for not believing in this book. You are in danger of hellfire because you do not believe this book. Well, what I say to you, Christians, is you need to get your own house in order before you attempt to get the house of other people in order. Because a lot of you people who profess to be Christians and tell other people what they need to do and how they need to believe in your book, you are not living a Christian life, and you know you're not. Matter of fact, I bet you're feeling conviction right now as I'm saying this. You know you're not. You see, it's not enough just to believe in your book. You know, I talked in my other video about Revelation 3.16, where God says, I would rather have you hot or cold. Your God that you profess to believe in your theistic God, your personal God, the God whom you say has written this book and who you believe has written this book. I told you before how he said in Revelations 3.16, I would rather have you hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I will spew, spew you out of my mouth. In other words, he's saying, I would rather have you hot or cold. In other words, I'd rather have you against me than lukewarm. And I, I posit to you that there's a lot of these Christians out here who are pointing their fingers at other people and telling them they need to believe in this book or they're going to burn. And they are lukewarm Christians. And there's another verse I would draw your attention to. And that verse is Luke 6.46. Make mo no mistake, I said I, I, I have read this book, so I can quote it chapter and verse. If a Christian quotes it to me, I will quote it right back to them in their face. And I will ensnare them with their own words and with the words of the book that they profess to believe in. Luke 6.46. Christians, if you don't know it by heart, I would advise you to get out your book and look it up. And you will find that your Lord, your Jesus, says in that verse, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not the things that I say? And what things does he say? Well, this book is full of things that he says. But you're not doing them. So why do you call him Lord, Lord? Your, your Lord is asking you that. Why are you calling me Lord? What, what right do you have to call me the Lord of your life when you're not doing the things that I say? See, that verse convicts you. That's not me. That's not Greg Solomon convicting you. That's your Lord convicting you with his words, not mine. What words are in this book? What things are you supposed to do? Where God says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I tell you to do? Well, let's just pick out one, one thing, one, one section, okay? Sexual sin. There's a lot of things in this book about sexual sin. And yet I know that there are a lot of Christians, and in fact, no, personally no Christians, who engage in sexual sin. Even though they profess to believe in this book, and they call the author of this book the Lord of their lives, but they engage in sexual sin. In essence, not doing what the Lord has told them to do. I posit to you that a lot of you Christians don't do what's right. You simply do what's convenient and then repent later. Until next time, this is Greg Solomon saying take care.